And people who are the naysayers on this one, I get you too, and then I could see your arguments, all right? But let's go by the scientist's uh, field, their perspective, because that's what this advanced discipleship teaching is about, all right? It's to go on their empirical, their scientific, their own perspective plane, and then show them how they're still wrong and that the Word of God is still right and that God exists. The universe is expanding, they say. So then how they trace the past, remember, is to make sure that they just have to go backwards because the universe keeps expanding, so you just go backwards. When they go backwards, remember, they realize then it has to reach a finite point. It has to reach a beginning, and that supported the Word of God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the atheists are in trouble because they can't say that we came from the universe or the universe evolved itself because the universe itself had a beginning. So what are they going to do? That's why they say gravity. Gravity is what created everything. But here's the problem with that argument. I don't know if you caught it last time, but I will give the documentation. I found the page now. Last time I didn't give it to you, which I apologize. But remember, all matter and energy in the universe, they admit had a beginning. For gravity to work, gravity is not a substance. All right, Gravity is not some kind of real thing. Gravity, remember, is a description. It's a law that describes the interaction of substances or things. So remember, the laws of physics are not things itself. It's only they are only description of things, see, more than one, yeah. see, how they interact with each other, okay? That's just a duh thing. But anyway, because gravity is a description, it's not a real thing, it's more of a description of things, how they interact. For gravity to work, how can it describe matter and energy interacting if scientists already admitted that matter and energy have a beginning? See the flaw to their argument? So in other words, you can't say that the universe, all matter and energy in the universe was created by gravity. See, that's how they deceived you. There is no such thing. Gravity, for it to work, there must be matter and energy. But they said matter and energy had a beginning. So then where did it come from then? So th that's the folly to their argument. Remember that they said that this is called no singularity, okay? Blech. Okay, there we go. So remember they said right here, uh, oh, excuse me, not no singularity, singularity. Okay, now I'm way off here. So in other words, through this extremity of this point, there is no space, zero spatial volume. That's why they call this space. Now you understand why scientists call this outer space or space? Because this space was created, and at the beginning when you go backwards, it's no space. For gravity to work, there must be matter and energy interacting in space. That's how the laws of science operate as well. The laws of science, how it operates, the essential ingredients for physics to work and other things is matter, energy, and then space. But then how can these operate without space? Uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer would ask his students, he's a PhD at Cambridge, how much stuff can you put in no space? They say none. So then, how can you say that gravity is what created us when over here is no space? Yeah, that's right, that's right. You can't put anything there. Amen. So gravity can't even do something right there because it needs the matter and energy as well. How much, space, uh, how much stuff can you put in no space? Nothing. Literally is what? Nothing. Amen. So then that is what the theologians, that is what Christians have always argued, that out of nothing, God created everything. See, ex nihilo, uh, creation out of nothing. So, 
Uh, let's look at the quotation right here from uh, Stephen Meyer. Moving toward this side. And uh, don't forget to uh, just keep pressing the switch angles. That's all that you have to do. And then make sure I'm in the right boundary lines. Now, notice that uh, it says right here, this is a return of the God hypothesis, page 116. Oddly, however, an infinitely tightly curved space corresponds to a radius of curvature of zero units in length and thus to zero, see that? Spatial volume. In 1978, the British physicist Paul Davies described the implications of the singularity theorems with great clarity. Remember, that's why I'm talking about the singularity point there. If we extrapolate this prediction to its extreme, we reach a point when all distances in the universe have shrunk to zero. An initial cosmological singularity therefore forms a past temporal extremity to the universe. We look at this. We cannot continue physical reasoning or even the concept of space-time through such an extremity. See, there is no physical explanation then at that point where you can physically explain how everything in this physical universe was created. Yeah. Do you understand? They say you can't. For this reason, most cosmologists think of the initial singularity as the beginning of the universe. On this view, the Big Bang represents the creation event, the creation not only of all the matter and energy in the universe, but also of space-time itself. Now, remember that I'm not endorsing Big Bang, but I pointed out that even if scientists believe Big Bang is true, it still points out that everything had a finite or a beginning. And I pointed out at uh, John 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, where I believe all of that so-called Big Bang came out was through God's word. Let there be light, like that, and then boom, and then it can spread out like that. But anyways, continuing on, this is what Meyer asked his students. To get my students to recognize the profundity of this result, I used to ask them, how much stuff can you put in no space? they would quickly realize that the answer to this question is none or no stuff. If at some point in the past space ceased to exist, remember zero spatial volume, then there would not at that point have been any place to put anything, whether matter or energy. Indeed, neither matter nor energy can exist in the absence. Remember zero, space and time. Thus Hawking, Ellis, and Penrose singularity proofs interpreted as a realistic depiction of the history and spatial geometry of the universe imply that a material universe of infinite density began to exist some finite time ago starting from nothing or at least from nothing spatial, temporal, material, or physical. Okay, now uh, returning on to the main point here. So this proves uh, the creationist argument. Now they mention right here it has to be obviously infinity. And remember the reason why this has to be infinity for Christians that's not a problem because we believe that God is infinite, right? And at that time there was nothing obviously during his infinite timeline. So because there was nothing but God this is not a problem to us. But then remember, the atheists, they always associate this with gravity, and they associate gravity with infinity. They always do that. They also talk about dark matter. They also talk about all these other elements. But remember, no matter and energy in zero space. Plus, even if they measure gravity or calculate gravity to have an infinite lifespan, it still does not get rid of its beginning. So everything had a beginning, including gravity. Why is that? Because the best example is you. You have a soul. Your soul is infinite. It's eternal. You can calculate that way. I don't care. But it nevertheless still points out it doesn't get rid of the fact that you do have a beginning. Same thing with hell. Had a beginning, but it's eternal. Heaven had a beginning, but it's eternal. Angels are eternal, but it had a beginning. Even Melchizedek all right, had a beginning too. Uh, actually, no, it said he had no beginning. So we'll put Melchizedek as the exception, all right? So I almost taught heresy there. But the point is, is that 
things that have an eternal lifespan does not necessarily mean it had no beginning. So I pointed, so those are just review, all right? But I've tried to expound it a little bit more so that you can understand what I was trying to drive at last time. Now we're gonna, let's see, we're gonna go backwards. Oh, that's the wonderful thing about this whiteboard. You can go backwards. So that's why they don't like this, that it's, that points out a beginning point. That points out finite, right? So at this boundary line is the finite. They don't like that. So then they want to try to keep going back. So then what they try to go back to is multi-universe. So then, in other words, there's another universe that gave birth to another universe, and they can just go back to infinity. That's the idea. They don't like this. So remember, the Big Bang model is the most accepted model, including by atheists and uh, agnostics and the majority of scientists. They try to go around the Big Bang model. In other words, what I mean by the Big Bang model is that the universe had a finite beginning. Majority believe that. Majority of scientists. But you can see this is unfavorable to atheists. Then they'll have to come to a point they have to recognize God. So then they have to insist and argue for naturalism to reign supreme, physical explanations to reign supreme. It must go on back to infinity. So then they say multi-universe argument. And then they have a thing called inflationary, I think, cosmology model let me t or cosmic model. Let me take a look at that one, all right? But the inflationary model. But even this inflationary model has a weakness which I'm going to show you. All right. This is uh, inflationary cosmology. Now, here are the uh, physicists in charge of it. So, uh, Guth, I think Volenkin as well. I'm not too sure. But let's go to the text and then we can see for ourselves. Okay. This is the uh, same book, page 120. During the 1980s, the physicists Alan Guth of MIT, Andre Linde of Stanford, and Paul Steinhardt of Princeton developed an alternative version of the Big Bang cosmology known as inflationary cosmology. What, what does that mean? The idea is this. Uh, let's go skip all the way down because we don't have, uh, like I said, my job is not for you to know every single detail, right? We just want to get to the main gist and then get the easy translation so that everybody can pretty much understand. This part. Subsequently, however, other physicists proposed eternal chaotic inflation models. Why is that? So they took the inflationary cosmology model from Alan Guth, and then what they did was they wanted to make it infinite. That way they could keep arguing uh, multi-universes that it's possible. The idea is this. That envision not a beginning, but an infinite number of beginnings. These eternal chaotic inflation models gained in popularity. So you can see the picture here, right? So remember from the drawing that I've given to you, and that's the singularity theorem uh, with Big Bang cosmology, it's like this, a beginning point, right? A triangle. But you notice right here what they're trying to do here. Yeah, because yeah, they want it infinite. So you can see that, what they're trying to do. Yeah, go crazy. Yeah, that's the idea. They want to go crazy. It was gaining popularity among proponents of inflation because many thought that the postulated inflation field would be subject to quantum fluctuations. So remember, I debunked that uh, quantum mechanics arguments that they insisted upon. So I will argue against it a little bit more as well, especially in this model right here. Uh, quantum fluctuations in the energy of the field. As a result, they thought these fluctuations would necessarily produce causally disconnected regions of space, effectively separate bubble universes, according to current eternal chaotic inflation models, after an initial phase of expansion, right? So remember that expansion? A quantum fluctuation in the energy of the inflation field caused it to decay locally. Now, all scientists admit this is that uh, we're in trouble in our world and possibly in our universe too because you can't go around uh, second law of thermodynamics and everything that's falling apart or decay or etc. So then there is an end and a beginning 
which is no problem for the Christians. But atheists, they do not like that. So then they twist it around by saying that it died and created. It died and created. It died and created. That's the idea. The inflation field also continued to operate outside our local area to produce a wider expansion of space into which other universes were birthed as the inflation decayed at other locations. So not necessarily saying that the universe uh, completely died, some previous universes completely died, that's not what I'm pointing out, but the idea is, I'm just trying to use very layman's terms so people can understand, is that some part that's decaying, then what they argue right here is that the inflation field, it started to produce a another field where it was decaying and then you can get another space and then you can get another universe. That's the idea. So it's basically what I'm saying. What decays, uh, you can create and then decays and create, decays and create, etc. So then there's so many different universes around us. That's very possible, the scientists argue right here. So uh, then uh, how do we argue against that? The simple answer is, believe it or not, the founders themselves. But uh, let's keep uh, reading. They, they believed it would continue indefinitely into the future. They therefore anticipated that the wider inflation field will spawn an endless number of other universes as it decays in local pockets of an ever-growing volume of space. Further, since the inflation field continues to expand at a rate vastly greater than the bubble universes expanding within it, none of these bubble universes will likely ever interfere with each other. The one inflation field therefore gives birth to endless bubble universes Universes, many worlds in one, as a Russian physicist, Alexander Vilenkin, has described it. But these founders themselves will uh, debunk it, believe it or not. Let's keep reading. Uh, they pointed out, Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin have showed that all cosmological models in which expansion occurs, including inflationary cosmology, multiverses, and the oscillating and cosmic egg models are subject, notice right here, to the BGV theorem. That's uh, Bord, Guth, and Vilenkin theorem. Why is that? Because they argued right here, if you go to the top, this is page 128, in short, in an expanding universe, the farther one follows the path of an object back in time, the greater its apparent velocity would have been in relation to an observer separated from it in space. But there is a catch. According to special relativity, an object in any frame of reference cannot go faster than the speed of light. Therefore, if we continue to extrapolate back into the past, the idea is this. Scientists see the uh, irrationality of an infinite going back. Because as you keep going back, they hit a limit point. That's the whole bottom line to this. Because they said it can't go faster than the speed of light. So then if that's the case, therefore if we continue to extrapolate back into the past, the spaceship would have relative to an observer eventually reached a limiting velocity, the speed of light. At that point, it would be impossible to go farther into the past. Indeed, since there is a limit to how fast an object can go in relation to any observer, there is a limit to how far back that path can be traced before reaching the limiting velocity of light. That point in the past would then represent an absolute beginning for the path of the spaceship and would mark the point at which space could not contract any further. Thus, it would also mark the point at which the expansion of space would have begun. In other words, the beginning of the universe. Continuing on, it says, Consequently, Vilenkin argues that evidence for a beginning is now almost unavoidable. As he explains, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Since our universe is expanding and the bord guth vilenkin theorem does not depend upon any energy conditions, the theorem has reinforced one of the main conclusions of the original Hawking-Penrose-Ellis result, that the universe had a temporal beginning, albeit on different theoretical grounds. So what 
physicists, or basically, to be more honest, atheists and agnostics who don't know much about physics or theoretical physics, they cannot argue against the bord gutt theorem and the Hawking-Penrose-Ellis singularity theorem. I showed you that singularity theorem thing, right? I, the bord gutt vilenkin theorem. They, they both reinforce no matter what model you pick yeah. for how our universe was created, they're all subject, no matter what model you pick, to those two theorems. That basically everything had a finite beginning. So that's the whole bottom line that you need to know. And then these are the big names that all you have to know is Stephen Hawking's singularity theorem and then the BGV theorem. But uh, let's look at uh, the founder himself. Atheists have actually, believe it or not, uh, abused... The bord gut vilenkin theorem, because they want to try to go around God is the one who created everything, or that the universe had a beginning. So these are two big names that all you need to know. These are two theorems that all you need to know, BGV and Hawking, that proves what? That proves this. Everything had a finite beginning. That's all you have to know, is these two things. That's all you have to know. Because why? Because even by common sense, just think about hitting back to the past. When you go to infinity, to the past, there's no doubt there's going to have to be a limit somewhere. See, there's no way around that. I mean, if you were to think logically, go back infinitely, all the substances in our universe or whatever naturally created us, you're going to have to reach a limit point. We saw one example about the speed of light, for example, right? So what are you going to do when you go around those things? But anyways, let's look at Vilenkin himself. Vilenkin himself, his law has been abused, and William Lane Craig actually brought this up in his debate. And then uh, we're going to see what Al uh, Alexander Vilenkin said, and then another founder uh, for the... Uh, BGV theorem, what they said. So they are open to multi-universes, but they say this, no matter how many multi-universes you want to argue, everything had a beginning. That's the bottom line. So you could have 20 universes and then eventually our universe, but it doesn't change the fact it still had a finite beginning. That's the bottom line. Everything. Everything. You can argue 50,000 multi-universes for all I care, but it still will hit a limit or a beginning. So uh, let's see what these people said, okay? Um, is it connecting? Come on, connect. Let's see here. The first argument oh, was based okay. on the origin of the universe. And I argued first that the universe began to exist. And he, here he says, well, but look, there are different multiverse scenarios, various models of the universe. I've talked about those in my opening speech and explained that the bord gut vilenkin theorem applies to those and shows the beginning of the universe. See, it doesn't and change it, that when, fact. Uh, vilenkin says that you can avoid the uh, bord gut vilenkin theorem by positing a contraction prior to this one. Now, this is a statement from a letter of Vilenkin to Victor Stinger, which is very a letter. quoted okay. out of context by atheists. Let me read you the full context. The Lincoln says, <clears throat> you can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. Ooh. This sounds as if there is nothing wrong with having a contraction prior to expansion. But the problem is that a contracting universe is highly unstable. Small perturbations would cause it to develop all sorts of messy singularities, so it would never make it to the expanding phase. So you see what's going on so far. So atheists have taken uh, Vilenkin out of context where they can argue for their multi-universe, inflationary cosmology. But even Vilenkin himself would point out that if you keep doing that, at, then it's going to be highly unstable. So then what's going to happen? It's not evolving. It's the opposite, de-evolution. It's more of destruction. So if you want to argue infinity, fine, but then you and I shouldn't be existing then. That's the problem. It becomes highly unstable, that kind of bubble universe. 
So let's keep going on. He says, if someone asked me whether or not the theorem I proved with Borg and Groove implies that the universe had a beginning, I would say that the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. If you are willing to get into subtleties, then the answer is no, but. That is to say, you've got the problem with the messy singularities that prevent re-expansion. So that's what atheists took out of context, is that they want to try to avoid a be beginning, because Vilenkin, he would say, uh, no, but remember, he put that uh, note of caution. But then how are you going to explain the unstable parts in our universe? Now, uh, why do you think scientists, we've seen it so many times in our previous teaching. Why is it that scientists don't want us uh, say for certainty this kind of stuff about there is a beginning to the universe, that there is intelligent design, that there is something supernatural. They don't want to outright say it because, like I told you, lest they be put out of the synagogue. So what they do to stay on the safe side is to point out basically pros and cons. But you notice right here that the pros are more on our side and the cons are more on the atheist side. We've seen that so far. Even through such careful wording by Vilenkin, which was taken totally out of context by atheists. See, he said that, no, uh, we don't have, uh, it doesn't mean that we have to have no, uh, we have to have a beginning. There's a, it's possible we could have a beginning. Scientists are always open to possibilities, but they're always looking at what's most probable, all right? And what's most probable is, yeah, it's possible you can go, uh, maybe you could go back and back and back, but it's not probable because it's so unstable. How, do you, how are you going to explain that part? So independent of that, Belenkin says, the remarkable thing about this theorem is its sweeping generality. We did not even assume that gravity is described by Einstein's equations. So if Einstein's gravity requires some modification, our collusion conclusion will still hold. So How about it, that? it isn't affected by having a quantum gravity uh, description. Here's Vilenkin's conclusion. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They <laughs> have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Whoa. How about that? But here's uh, another person right here, all right? This is uh, from Alan Guth, I believe, and he was being interviewed. So, okay, we want to find out about the beginning of the universe, how it began, and we have these three properties. We have the composition of the universe, we have the geometry of the universe, and we have the homogeneity, as well as the homogeneity of the universe, and understanding those three. Now, each of the three, the mechanisms to explain that, are they indeed consistent with at least this universe having a beginning? Uh, yeah, all three of these depend crucially on the idea that the universe started out incredibly small and has been expanding dramatically since then. And that's what results in the cooling, which allows these funny processes that bring even that baryon number to happen in the early universe, but they clearly they turned off. In the present universe, the baryons just sit there uh, and are stable. And that's true of the other properties as well. So, yeah, it certainly looks like uh, the universe that we observe around us, uh, the universe as we know it, definitely had a beginning. Uh, that doesn't mean that that beginning was necessarily the ultimate beginning of all reality. But then it's a pretty... You know why they talk like that, right? Yeah. But the universe as we know it certainly began, we think, about 13.7 billion years ago. So listen to this part. The theory which explains some of those properties so, so wondrously uh, would engender the possibility of there being other beginnings, but I think you and some others have shown that ultimately there had to be some uh, original, the mother of all beginnings. So you notice that? So they're open to multi-universes. They're open to the inflationary cosmological model. But nevertheless, it still had a beginning. <laughs> okay, so keep, keep hearing. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, those issues are still a little unclear. I wouldn't uh, say that those things are shown beyond a doubt. Uh, but with reasonable assumptions, one could show that even in the context of inflation, with many bubbles forming, um, 
it would still be somewhere and ultimately beginning. Oh, you know, you notice that? He was like, this doesn't necessarily mean it's an ultimate beginning. And then now he's going, but yeah, reasonably assume, you know, that had an ultimate beginning. You see this talk? You know, I, they don't want to be put out of the synagogue. They know that they would support the uh, Christian viewpoint. This proves more and more. So you see more and more. There's no doubt there is bias in our scientific field. There is no doubt about that because there is fear. All right. There is fear there. All right, so hopefully that was enjoyable and that it gave you a little bit of an eye-opener. Now let's continually debunk this, all right? Man, I don't know if I'm going to get to the Bayesian probability calculus. I want to do that. Let's see. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, but first, let's argue. Remember this. Their argument uh, for all of this is laws of physics created us. Law of gravity created us. Remember that argument? So... How did we debunk this? I taught you easily last time that through this example that uh, these are not substances or actual things. These are descriptions for the interaction of substances or things. Now remember, I say substances uh, loosely. I'm just trying to translate in words that way people can understand. So remember, an example is this. They say gravity was what created us. No, that doesn't make sense. It's like saying, uh, let's say that uh, one person, uh, God forbid this would happen in our church, got mad at another person in the church and stabbed that person with the knife. So here is thing number one who stabbed, used a, an object, a knife, upon thing number two. See, that's an interaction of those two things, right? So then we can say that murder is what caused uh, that guy thing number one to stab thing number two. No, murder didn't cause that. Murder is a description of such an interaction. What caused it is what? Maybe jealousy. What actually caused it was thing number one's mentally unstable. We don't know, but the point is our job is to investigate the cause, not simply describing the interaction. So remember, that was easily debunked. Uh, you see... Uh, John Lennox and those guys who just laughed about the argument about gravity creating everything, or math is what created us. Remember, it's still a description, because remember, let's say this, another example. Uh, there are 10 people in the church, all right? We just had a very low day, and then we're all surviving, you know, through the hard times, the government's hounding us or something, whatnot. I don't know, all right? So let's say there's 10 people, one person walked out of the church uh, mad after the preaching, succumbed to... Uh, the government system, the liberal world, all right? So then math is what caused that to happen, right? No. What, subtraction is what caused it to happen? No. Something in the message offended that person. That's the cause. Yeah. But whatever caused it, our job is to find the cause, not just simply describing an interaction. You can describe an interaction through laws of physics, you can describe an interaction mathematically, but those things don't cause it. So remember I showed you that's the weakness to their arguments. It's simply a description. Now here's another thing to keep in mind to debunk that argument about laws of physics is what created us. Math is what created us. Another uh, debunking to that, which uh, the atheists or the agnostics uh, don't think about is the very definition itself, the very definition itself or the very foundations of physics. So before I get over there, let me show you a quote so that you can better understand. Let's go to, oh, come on, all right. All right, they're called initial and boundary conditions. Okay, but I think what I should do is first uh, give the definition for scientific laws, especially laws of physics. So let's look at basic. The very basic of basic, and then the very basic of basics will be a kid's scientific, uh, a kid's scientific term. So this is what little children should basically know. So if PhD people mess up on this one, then they don't even know little kitty stuff, okay? The idea is this. When we study the laws of science, a scientific law is a statement, is a statement describing 
what always happens under what? Certain conditions. That's important to understand. For physics, the laws of physics uh, to operate and work, remember it's an interaction of things, right? How things interact with each other. So how are things going to interact with each other if there's no conditions in play? So for example, to call it murder, you need certain conditions. A knife goes inside the body, Thing number one was the one who caused it to happen. And then also there's malice. There's intention of malice in there. So certain conditions for subtraction, math to work, okay. Uh, what do you need? You need certain conditions, right? One person's got to leave the room out of a sermon where, where the sermon offended that person and etc. So certain conditions are operating which is how things interact with each other. Does that make sense? All right. So there has to be conditions in play for things to interact. That way we can describe it properly, which laws of physics. Now, the essential ingredients within conditions in physics is what they call boundary and initial conditions. You can't do physics or math that relates to science, that relates to physics without uh, the, the initial and the boundary conditions. So let's read that part here. Uh, okay. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right. We go to the bottom. Uh, though this, uh, let's see right here. When scientists describe the behavior of physical systems, they not only must know the relevant laws of nature, they must also know specific facts about the objects to which the laws apply. In other words, the conditions, see that? Or states in which the relevant objects under study find themselves. These facts may include the tension in a string, the angle of an inclined plane, or the force applied by a cue to a pool ball, for example. This is page 270. Such specific facts allow physicists to describe nature accurately using various laws of physics. But without these extrinsic inputs of information, what physicists call initial and boundary conditions, the law themselves will not yield precise descriptions of any material system. As Michael Polanyi noted, physics is dumb without the gift of boundary conditions forming its frame. A boundary condition is always extraneous to the process which it delimits. In Galileo's experiments on balls rolling down a slope, the angle of the slope was not derived from the laws of mechanics but was chosen by Galileo. Indeed, all known laws of physics require such extrinsic inputs of information about the features of the system, their initial and boundary conditions, or about the objects to which they apply. So they're in trouble right here. As you can see so far, the bottom line is this. They want to argue law, laws of physics, law of gravity, you can argue law of any uh, physics law, is what created us. No, they're descriptions. For the laws of physics, where we can actually apply it to real life scenarios, you need conditions. That's a no-brainer. You can't just call this thing murder if there are no conditions in there. Ma intent of malice, a knife stuck into the body, thing number one had the malice intention, etc. You need conditions, otherwise it's, you, you cannot call it murder. It's just pretty much dumb without conditions. Does that make any sense? So conditions are basic, rudimentary, fundamental things where you, where you need to consider as you apply the law of physics upon some things that are interacting with each other. Okay, we follow so far, right? You need conditions, that's the bottom line. You need those conditions. That's all you need to know. These conditions are necessary.
They say law is what created us. No, that doesn't explain the conditions. That's the thing. See? How are you going to go around that? Murder, okay? The description murder will not explain, will not show the cause. It doesn't explain or show the cause of the condition. See that? It's merely a description. Murder. Our job is, again, you need to find the cause. You need to find the conditions. Guess what? They don't know how to explain it. And what's worse is that these conditions, when you look at our universe, it's so complex if one iota is out of place, remember, you can eliminate life. So here's the worst part for physics, phys uh, for scientists. They're fine-tuned. The law is not going to explain that. How are you going to uh, explain boundary and initial conditions that are fine-tuned? Because the law, you won't, it'll be dumb without the condition first to begin with without the conditions to begin with. Simultaneously or first, I don't care. But the bottom line is, it's dumb without conditions. And it doesn't explain the boundary and initial conditions, which are already fine-tuned. That's how they do the math as well. They argue about constants. They argue about uh, the conditions, initial conditions of the universe, etc. That's all necessary, basic, fundamental ingredients when they do their equations, when they try to apply these things in real-life scenarios. That's a huge problem to them. So then you know how they get around that? How they get around it is because they watch so much Hollywood. Theory of everything, you know? That's what they call it. Oh, now they get into La La Land here, all right? So then they talk about uh, the theory of everything. In other words, um, yeah, right here. There must be another law behind all those other laws. A law that can explain everything that happened in our universe. So that's how they go around it, all right? <laughs> so that's how they, uh, they always come up, uh, they always come up with their excuses. They say, nevertheless, some have proposed that physicists will eventually discover a new, more general law, sometimes called a theory of everything, that will explain the origin of the fine-tuning of the universe. They hope that such a theory will show that there are no free parameters, that is, that there are no parameters or values for the physical constants left undetermined by an underlying, all-encompassing general law. All right? I think that's the law of God, but anyway, besides that, though this proposal may sound plausible, let's even assume it, okay? It betrays a significant confusion about the logical structure of scientific laws. How can we describe, how can we find the right laws, how are laws formed? It cannot go without what again? Conditions. It destroys a, lo destroys a logical structure. For you to argue that there's a law without the need of conditions to explain everything about the fine-tuning of the universe, you destroy even the basic of the use of scientific laws. How about that? Again, let me read that quote again. When scientists describe the behavior of physical systems, they not only must know the relevant laws of nature, they must also know specific facts about the objects to which the laws apply. In other words, the conditions or states in which the relevant objects under study find themselves. So then they argue super law. More e the bottom, more even, even if some future super law were discovered that generated all the values of the present constants of physics, such a law would not eliminate the need for initial and boundary conditions as well as other constants with specific values. Uh, here's another one right here. This is huge. Especially if conditions are fine-tuned. That's worse then. It says right here, thus to say that there is some as yet undiscovered general law of nature that will ultimately explain all the specific values of the fine-tuning without itself having to have finely tuned initial and boundary conditions and constants again ignores the nature. It's built within its nature. I thought you're a naturalist. 
I thought your job is to find natural explanations. You contradicted yourself now. You went into la-la land. You went into fantasy land, that there's some imaginary law out there. It ignores the nature of natural laws and what they need in order to describe nature accurately. So how are you going to go against that? You cannot go against it. You need conditions. There is no law superseding above other laws without the use of conditions. You need conditions. That's the very basics of physics as well. Do I need to show you the picture again of Kitty grade school defining laws of physics? Probably, yeah. I'll probably have to do that. Now, I know you can get all technical, you know, well, those conditions are different from the conditions that you're using on that Kitty grade school website, whatever. But I don't care about all that. The bottom line is, through all this, the bottom line in amateur terms is you can't eliminate conditions in physics. It's so, uh, it's so necessary, boundary and initial conditions. All right, here's uh, another one. Uh, let's see right here. Oh, here's a brilliant way to go around it. Sean Carroll, all right? He defines naturalism as the idea that the things that happen in the universe are ultimately explicable by the fundamental laws of nature, see? They all want to stop right there, laws of nature. But then again, here we go, yet even if one defines the laws as including the constants, the laws certainly do not contain information about the initial conditions of the universe. You're trapped there. Yet those conditions also, this is worse, exhibit extreme fine-tuning that the laws don't explain. Moreover, simply defining constants as part of the laws of physics still does not explain why the physical constant themselves have the exact values they do. What's the idea? The very basic ingredients to the physics and the laws of physics, their use of it, is fine-tuned itself. That's, that's huge. That's really huge. There's no other way around this. Okay, so then let me go back here. So they have to argue, you notice how uh, eternity for naturalism is so important to them, right? All natural things in our universe, what created us, there must be something that's eternal that can create us. That's so important to them. You notice that, right? So then they argued for a primeval atom. All right, so this is the problem, okay? So there's just some primeval atom that, you know, had an infinite beginning, and because of that, that's where we all came from. Here's the problem, okay? The problem is this. And even if some other material entity was available to cause such a change, here's the easy question. Why had it not done so an infinite time ago? Are you telling me this uh, atom, whatever name you want to call it, all right? And let's include gravity if that is an actual real substance you want to call it, or dark matter or whatever. Get rid of the singularity theorem, fine. You're telling me they did absolutely nothing for eternity? See, that's why you can't argue infinite beginning for natural elements. That's very bad for them. You're telling me there was no evolution involved for infinite beginning. Does that make any sense to any of you? The, here's the only logical thing that's going to make sense to you is that there's a God, okay? That's the only thing that will make that you can comprehend that. But natural elements doing that? No, -uh. it's something supernatural, no doubt about that. Why then would a sudden change occur only a finite time ago if there had been an infinite number of opportunities for such a change of state to occur over an infinite time? This is even from the physicists. As physicist Anthony Aguirre and John Kehayas have noted, it is very difficult to devise a system, especially a quantum one, that does nothing forever then evolves. That's contradictory. A truly stationary or periodic quantum state which would last forever would never evolve. Whereas one with any instability, if it's unstable, right, like the people try to go around BGV theorem, you know, went around infinitely, 
whereas one with any instability will not endure for an indefinite time. That's huge, man. This is extremely huge that debunks uh, the atheist argument here. Now, another thing that I want to uh, point out is, oh, I erased the whole thing. I'm sorry about that. Looks like it got erased. Maybe I can go backwards. Nope. Okay, it's all erased. So uh, continuing on the topic, or did I, is it somewhere here? No, it's not here. Uh, yeah, it's an infinite beginning, so I, good luck finding that. <laughs> What's that? I just signed out. Oh, is that what happened? Oh, well, it's okay. I'll just make a new drawing right here. So uh, I'm going to make a new drawing. So you notice there's no way around a finite beginning. You can't argue for infinity, all right? They think they're Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. <laughs> they go to La La Land, make up stuff. So now they argue this, which is uh, uh, so ridiculous. So Sean Carroll, he just wants to insist naturalism reigns supreme and that uh, you can't go behind naturalism. You can't argue for God. So then he argues this. Here's another way around it, okay? He argues, Sean Carroll, one of the most prominent proponents of naturalism, has acknowledged that naturalism has not explained the origin of the universe be precisely because it can offer no cause capable of producing it. He suggests, however, that the origin of the universe does not necessarily require a causal explanation. It might just be. That's it. <laughs> oh, now they're getting into philosophical arguments. They're getting outside of empirical scientific arguments. You see that there? You see that there? Nevertheless, because the evidence, and that's scientific evidence, not just philosophical, indicates that the universe has not existed infinitely, but instead began to exist, it would seem to require, by the principles of causality and sufficient reason, a cause. Saying otherwise undermines one of the basic presuppositions of scientific investigation and indeed of reason itself. So it contradicts reason, it contradicts logic, it contradicts philosophically speaking and scientifically speaking. What is it? Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. So there's no way around this. There is no way around this. Okay, now uh, let me cover real briefly and I guess I'll have to expand it uh, later on. I'm going to expand it later on about uh, let's see right here, Bayesian, Bayesian probability calculus. Now, I'm going to just explain this part very briefly through an example, and then I'll expound it more uh, in our next lesson, because I only have five minutes. Let's see how I can explain you calculus in five minutes. Uh, the Bayesian probability calculus, let's go back. You probably forgot this in our beginning. Inference to the best explanation. Now, you remember that? That is Darwin. That is from Charles Lyell. These are basically uh, the key players, if not the founders, of a lot of evolutionary theories today. They use this principle. It's a scientific principle. It's no philosophical rationale theory. This is actual empirical scientific practice itself, applied to real life scenarios, okay? Inference to the best explanation, remember. The idea is to find out the past, what happened in the past, you look at current uniform experience. That's the very definition of empiricism. What you experience around you and find out which one of them is the most, uh, is the most appropriate explanation to the past. So remember we mentioned about uh, naturally by itself, necessity. That don't work, remember? Because it has a finite beginning. We also looked at uh, chance. We've seen how that doesn't work because that is not natural, all right? One big scientific authority explained that as well when he studied uh, uh, genetics and all that. So we saw that this was not natural as well. The only thing is intelligent design. And that was the most logical explanation, as I pointed out to you before. 
So this is not just guesswork. This is actual scientific practice. What this is called is inference to the best explanation. This is what, uh, this is a more scholarly scientific term and practice that Bible believers have always done. And that is back at the days of Dr. Upman's school, he mentioned we have to look at the origin of our universe. That's how we believe there is a God. What created our universe? And there were only, he added a fourth one, which was illusion, which I'm not going to even add right here because scientists won't go that far. But the idea is the, it was matching all of these, uh, pretty much all those three points that we've looked at. But here's the actual scientific term if you want to use it now. If scientists don't want to listen to your arguments that you learn back at uh, Pensacola Bible Institute, then use the scientific term. This is Darwin. Darwin actually used this, okay? Now, this will expand more on the inference to the best explanation. How Bayesian probability calculus works is by the following. All right, how I'm going to do the following is not by reading to you. I'll read it to you next time. But what I'm going to do is you're just going to have to take my word for it. <laughs> and then you can uh, compare it uh, later on in these pages I'm about to give to you. So then the pages are on uh, page 224 all the way to page 235, 235, all right? Now, these are based off of abductive inferences, but I don't have really much time to expound that one. Bottom line is this. Now, abductive inferences are more powerful than deductive inferences. Now, why is that important? Because William Lane Craig is probably the best uh, scholastic authority to debunk atheism. He always uses this, deductive inferences. But abductive inferences is actually more powerful than deductive inferences. Because in deductive inferences, you have to go by what is true. What is true. But abductive, what that is, it's more dependent upon possibilities and probabilities, which is more scientific. Scientists always go by that route. So if atheists want to argue possibilities, there is no God, we are open to that, but what is nevertheless still more probable when we compare these pointers to the inference to the best explanation, still don't change the fact intelligent design is the most probable, scientifically speaking, and that is a realistic everyday practice, not just in scientific, uh, developing scientific experience, but even your common sense every day of living. So how I'm going to do that now, abductive inferences, it's used by the example of Napoleon. So uh, how, do we, uh, how do we know that Napoleon exists? It's a possibility that he may not have existed. Fine, but that's not probable because given, listen, given the evidence that supports our hypothesis, supports our theory, supports our, um, uh, our thought, okay? So which one of these points, okay, which one of these theories which one of these, if you want to call it a hypothesis, fine. Which one of them is most probable, given the evidence? That's how you make, uh, you make your logical assumptions, including scientific realistic experiments. So what it does is, uh, let's put hypothesis right now, okay? So here's a hypothesis or point, or whatever you want to call it, all right? So these are the three right here that we're comparing as well. But let's say there's a hypothesis. What you do is given the evidence, you find out what is most probable. So we'll put that as P. Now, in Bayesian terms, I'm going to give it to you. It first starts out with uh, likelihoods, okay? So in likelihoods, so what is most likely, right? Likelihoods are described as follows. What is most probable by, uh, I think it's parentheses, evidence given the hypothesis. That's how they do it. 
then what they have is comparing likelihoods. Let's see right here. Yeah, they have a thing called comparing likelihoods. I am going to grab this so I can draw this more quickly. So then the comparing, so now we're building up the probability. See that? We're going to build it up more. The comparing of likelihoods would be described by, we can discover what is most probable by the evidence given the hypothesis is stronger than, uh, let's see right here, the probability of this evidence given by the other hypothesis, all right? So uh, remember, this is hypothesis, uh, I'll just say hypothesis A, hypothesis B. So we're trying to figure out, remember, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're trying to figure out what, which hypothesis is stronger. Is it going to be A here? Is it going to be B here? Is it going to be C here? All right? So remember, that's what we're doing in Bayesian terms. Now, uh, let's see right here. Let's go back. Let's build this up even more so. How we build this up even more so in Bayesian terms is what they call posterior probability. And, we're gonna, and this is all Bayesian probability formulas here. So how you do it is as follows. The probability of the hypothesis given the evidence. So we switch the letters now, all right? Instead of evidence given the hypothesis, let's go by hypothesis given the evidence itself. So probable based on which hypothesis, so let's say A, hypothesis A given the evidence. So we judge the hypothesis by the evidence now. That's why we can judge what is most probable in the hypothesis. So we're going to judge if chance, given the evidences we see, is most probable compared to the probability of hypothesis C, intelligent design, given the evidences that we see. Okay? So now we're going to compare those two now. Okay? And actually, it's more emphasized, definitely greater than. That's the idea. So then let's uh, give it to an example here. Let's say that you come to an abandoned cabin, OK? And that, uh, let's say you come into a cabin. When you come inside this cabin, you're coming from a long height. You see a cabin there, and you're like, oh, there's shelter. You go inside over there. Now, in your mind, you thought it's abandoned, right? So that's your hypothesis A. But then when you walk inside, all of a sudden, you see a, a hot cup of tea there, and it's still smoking. Now, that's the evidence. Given that evidence, you switch your hypothesis. You don't think it's abandoned now. Given the evidence, you switch your hypothesis. Oh, it's inhabited. So the inhabited cabin, that hypothesis, let's say it's C, hypothesis C is now greater then hypothesis A, that it's abandoned. Why? Given the evidence. Everybody does this in realistic, everyday life. Yeah. Now, what if it comes in unexpected terms, a surprise, where you now see a plate of food? That's evidence two. Evidence three, you see clothes on a chair. Evidence four, you hear a shower running in a different location, in a different room. Look at that. So given multiple evidences now, when you have evidence, keep building upon evidence, 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 you truly abandon hypothesis A, abandon cabin, with hypothesis, hypothesis C, that it's inhabited. That's the same thing right here. See that? You see how this works? Given evidence after evidence that we've seen, Evidence after evidence, BGV theorem, singularity theorem, uh, the DNA, uh, we covered fine-tune. Even the laws of physics themselves are fine-tuned. People get around DNA by arguing, well, what about RNA? It doesn't change the fact that you still get intelligent designers who have to come up with the experiments so that you can get the DNA life that you want through RNA. You have to have intelligent designers doing that. And by the way, they can only reach so far. They can only reach so far. 
Because why? Like we've studied in other scientific practices that atheists try to get around, everything always decays. It just dies out. It just reaches a limit. The only way you can overpass that limit is an intelligent designer <laughs> all the time. All the time. So then, given evidence after evidence after evidence, why do you reject this hypothesis? That is a scientific fact, and we even used it mathematically speaking, too. Amen. Bayesian probability calculus. You know. All right? So we see right here how wrong those naturalists, materialists, atheists, and even agnostics are. Amen. There is truly, okay, what scientifically stands, what is most probable mathematical terms, Bayesian terms, scientific terms, I don't care what you call it, is that it's intelligent design. I'll explain that more in our next uh, advanced discipleship class. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to our people, gave us scientific evidence that you are real, that you are true, and that truly the heavens declare the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.